Hi all, I'm Dr. Clark here again. Um, today for a general biology lecture, I'm going to talk about cells. So I'm really, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really going to introduce cell principles. Um, so like the tenets of the cell theory, um, why cells are small, and what is kind of the membrane made of. Um, hold cells together. In future lectures I'm going to talk about prokaryotes, so non-nucleated cells, okay, and eukaryotes and kind of the gist of those two. And then we're going to talk about organelles and um, how cells link together and uh, how cells feed and all kinds of things as we progress. Okay, So first I really just want to talk about kind of what a cell is, what makes up a cell, just in general, kind of basic principles. Okay, so here you can see a very complex picture, or at first it looks very complex because there's lots of words and, and, and dots and lines. And, okay? But the basic importance that you can see from the picture is these little balls with lines coming off. These are phospholipid bilayer, or that's what this is, is a phospholipid bilayer. These are phospholipid molecules. Okay? which means they have a phosphate head and lipid tails or um, fatty acid tails. Okay? Remember from last lecture, fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. Okay? And so they will be pointing in towards each other, away from the extracellular fluid and the cytoplasm. Okay? These phosphate heads can form hydrogen bonds with cytoplasm and extracellular fluid, so they're hydrophilic. Okay? And that's really the premise behind the cell membrane. The rest of this is just so things can cross, or so we can identify this membrane or this cell as being self-made. Okay, So there's some communication issues, communication importance here. Okay? Um, there's some skeletal arrangement, so cytoskeleton um, that would be holding different organelles in place and things like that. And we'll get to this um, as we progress. Okay. So first, <coughs> cells. All cells are small, and we'll discuss why all cells are small, or um, at least the principle by which cells have to follow, um, and that makes them small. Okay. And um, we've already talked a little bit about Robert Hooke. Remember, he's the first person to describe a cell. Okay? Um, and he described the cell of cork. Okay? So um, it was a plant cell and rectangular in shape. He called it a cell. Um, most uh, of the writings suggest that he named it after the rooms that monks stayed in, which were called cells at the time, um, and they're kind of rectangular, square, and small, and uh, and that's what he kind of named it after. Other people think he, he think that he might have named it after jail cells, but regardless, um, still rectangular objects rect or rectangular places, okay, and that's where the name came from. Now, Robert Hooke. I'll talk about him a little bit more later, okay? but he was not the first to invent a microscope, but he was really the first documented individual to utilize a microscope to see um, cells and coin the term. Okay? Later on, okay, roughly 100, almost 200 years, 100, 150 years ago, later, okay, <coughs> we have almost 200 years. We have um, two individuals, Schleiden and Schwann, who are um, very important for the tenets of cell theory. Okay? So Schleiden was a plant biologist and Schwann was an animal biologist. And together they came up with a few pieces to the cell theory. Okay? First, that all organisms are made up of cells, or at least one cell. Okay. 
and cells are the smallest unit of life. Okay, so these two tenets of the cell theory really are contributed to Schladen and Schwann. <clears throat> now, their work couldn't have been done without Hooke's work and then also without another um, individual, individual named Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, okay, who was a microscope inventor, okay, and he made like 200, 250 different types of microscopes. Um, and Schladen and Schwann, even though, you know, we're looking at 160, 170 years later when they started doing their work, they're still working with um, the inventions of Leeuwenhoek and his microscope and glass work that he um, put forth. Okay, so Sladen and Swan came up with these pieces, um, and then um, one more tenant was added by Louis Pasteur. Okay, and that's all cells come from pre-existing cells. We'll get to that. Okay, I forgot that I put this in here um, mainly because I think that not very many people know about Robert Hooke. Not people, not very many people um, have really even heard of Robert Hooke, and he was a integral part in science. But he is also um, an engineer, uh, astronomer, um, and he needs a lot more credit than he has received um, from the scientific field. Okay, uh, I highly suggest um, either one of these books. I like the Curious Life of Robert Hooke a little better. Um, because there's a little more biology in it, okay? but uh, Out of the Shadow of a Giant is an excellent book about Hooke um, and other um, astronomers and other scientists that were overshadowed by individuals like Isaac Newton. Okay? There's pretty good evidence. Now everyone knows Newton. Everyone you know, um, is very familiar with Newton and Newton's work, okay? and I'm not trying to take any credit away from Newton. But I am trying to say that Newton didn't give people credit and stole their ideas. And one man that he stole ideas from was Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke, based on the documents that we have, was probably the first person to ever write about gravity. Okay? And so even though we give credit and say Newton described, discovered, however you want to put it, gravity, Robert Hooke, based on what we know, was the first person to write about it um, and gave Newton those ideas to explore um, gravity. So Out of the Shadows of a Giant is an excellent book about kind of I guess the race for explaining the universe and um, the little people that kind of got forgot like Hook and Haley um, and the giants like Newton um, who kind of get most of the credit. Anyways, if you're interested, check them out. Okay. So the size of cells, again, they're small. Okay. So we were leaving off, uh, you know, a couple lectures ago, we were talking about chemistry. We were talking about protons and neutrons and electrons. Okay. So we're talking about the 0.2 nanometer kind of range. Then we started talking about molecules. And so maybe we're talking about water molecules or you know, some simple simple molecule um, might be in the two nanometer range somewhere in there, and kind of this process, okay, this kind of series of lectures, you know, on cells, we'll start talking about some structures like ribosomes, the large and small subunit of ribosome, which is in that twenty nanometer range. The ribosome complex. This is where proteins are being put together. Okay, so this little green line here is messenger RNA running through a protein and that's going to, or running through a ribosome and that's going to construct an amino acid chain. We talked about this before. Okay, and we'll go into a lot more detail about that. This is an organelle. Okay, this is the mitochondria. Most of you know this as the powerhouse of a cell. Okay, you know, you're looking at two micrometers. Uh, is about the size of that. Now, the mitochondria, interestingly, and we'll get to this a little bit later, okay, the mitochondria shows a lot of signs of um, prehistoric, being a prehistoric cell, 
uh, itself. And mitochondria has its own DNA. It has its own ribosomes. Okay, it can it functions as if it's its own um, entity, like its own cell with inside of a cell. Except for you can't remove mitochondria um, from the cell and have it work. Okay, um, so there's some symbiosis going on there. Um, we call this endosymbiosis. We'll get to this later. Okay. So really where we're at right now when we start talking about cells is we're talking about 20 micrometers um, is the average kind of cell, you know, link or cell um, width. Okay? And um, that's kind of where we're at. So I just want to kind of put that in perspective, what we're talking about, 20 micrometers. Um, you know, the microscopes that you'll use in a typical bio class might get you, well, it gets you to 20 micrometers, okay? you'll be able to see faint mitochondria. It might get you, it'll get you a little closer than this, um, maybe down to seeing the 10 micrometer range. Um, and then you'll have to use something like an electron microscope to see this range and this range. Um, okay, but we'll, we'll progress. We'll, we'll talk about that when we start talking about microscopes later. Okay. All right, so the cell theory, again, um, we kind of already talked about this. Okay. Schwaden and Schladen and Schwann came up with all organisms are comprised of one or more cells. Cells are the smallest living thing. And then Antoine von Leeuwenhoek came up with all cells arise from pre-existing cells. Okay, we already talked about this before. Um, remember, in the time, in this time period, okay, before um, Louis Pasteur came up with this third tenet. It was thought that you know cells would just poof into existence. That a greater being um, made cells. So if bread was sitting on a counter and it molded, the great that greater superior being put mold on there um, just because. Okay, and there's different explanations of why they would put mold on there, or it would put mold on there, or however you want to refer to the greater being um, until. You know, Louis Pasteur came came along and really said, "Look, um, it's it's not magic. It's not a superior being doing this. There are cells floating around all over the room, um, microscopic cells that just land on the bread and then grow mold or bacteria or whatnot." Okay? So all cells come from pre-existing cells. Okay, <clears throat> and so. Back to the size thing, um, cells are really small because large cells don't function efficiently. And what I mean by that is something that we call surface, um, surface area to volume ratio. Okay? So what happens is as a cell increases in size, okay, the control center for the cell, which we would call the nucleus, but there are lots of other um, control centers for the cell. So the nucleus is going to control protein production, but other things like the endoplasmic reticulum and things like that might control fat or lipid production. Um, the Golgi apparatus is going to control packaging and things like that. But as your cell gets bigger and bigger, the control centers get further and further away from the cell membrane. And the reason why that's important is along the cell membrane, there are protein ports, which we showed, I showed you at the very beginning of the lecture. These protein ports are what allows for things to come in. Carbohydrates, other proteins, amino acids, water, lots of different things are going to flow into the cell and flow out of the cell. When the cell gets larger and larger, okay, the surface area is not growing as fast as the volume. Okay? And because the volume is growing faster than the surface area, the amount of connection points is actually decreasing over time for a given volume okay? and makes it more difficult for the cell to communicate. Okay? And I'll show you a diagram of this that will make a little bit more sense, hopefully. So instead of being a bunch of big cells, okay, all organisms are made of very small cells. Okay? So, you know, this is, for most people, this is a little bit of a concept that's kind of difficult to think about. But if we took cells from something like an elephant, 
and then our cells, and then a mouse's cells. Okay, we're all mammals, okay? and so we all have non-nucleated red blood cells, and, and uh, you know, very similar cell structure. Okay, all those cells are the same size: the mouse's cell, the human cell, the elephant cell. Okay. Every one of those cells is nearly identical in size. Okay? In fact, if I put them all on a slide, you wouldn't be able to tell me which cell was an elephant, which cell was a human, which cell was a mouse. Okay? You just can't do it. So large organisms like elephants, they're just made of more cells. Okay? Humans are made of more cells than a mouse, okay? and elephants are made of more cells than a human. Okay? It's not bigger cells. Just more of them. Okay? And that's really because of this limitation, okay? the surface to volume ratio. Okay? And surface meaning surface area. So how much area you have on the outside related to the volume on the inside. So as you increase the cell, like I said before, the volume grows faster than the surface area. <coughs> And so again, like I said, the surface area, that outer membrane, is the connecting point between the outside world and the inside world. And the more volume, the more area you have inside of that membrane, right, the more connection points you need, okay, because you're going to need more, you know, Mitochondria, you're going to need more chloroplasts, you're going to need more endoplasmic reticulum, you're going to need more lysosomes, you're going to need more materials to run the cell, okay? but now you have fewer connection points. Okay? So here is kind of a, a better diagram to show this. Okay? It doesn't matter what the unit is, but if we take the radius of this and compare it to the radius of that, okay, um, this is 10 times the size of this. So if we go down and we start looking at surface area, so the surface area is 12.57 for this. Okay, So that's how much, whatever the unit is, how much on the outside, what's the area on the outside. Okay? And here the, the surface area is 1,257. Okay? So this is 100 times the size of this. Okay? So a 10-fold increase increases the surface area by 100 times and then the volume the volume is 4.189 okay, versus 4189 units so a tenfold increase in size of the radius results in a hundred times the surface area but a thousand times the volume okay this is where the issue is Okay. The distance from the nucleus, that's what this purple dot is, to that outer membrane increases faster than the amount of outer membrane or the size of the outer membrane. Okay. And that makes large cells far less efficient than small cells. Right. Now, to get around this, you can start cheating the system. And what I mean by cheating the system is through evolutionary quarks, mutations, you could start developing projections okay, or folds in your surface area. Okay? So to increase surface area, you can just um, have dendrites okay, that would come off of your cells. So long spindles okay, that have connection points that allow for you know, interconnection between, you know, the outside source and the inside source. Or, you know, in things like microvilli, which look kind of like finger projections inside your stomach, you could have a bunch of inner folds that are running around those fingers, okay? And that would increase the surface area, which would allow you to have a much larger cell. So things like neurons, okay, micro microvilli, these cells are actually large. Okay? They're fairly large um, when compared to other cells. Okay? But the reason why they can become large is because they've 
mutated to have a increase in surface area. Okay, so they have more connection points between the outside surface and the inside. Okay. If you're not going to do that, then cells are not efficient at all when they get larger, especially in a spherical form, okay, or a rectangular form, it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's why organisms are really just made up of a bunch of small cells, not large cells. Okay. So when we look at cells in general though, and this is regardless of the type of cell, okay, it's got to be organized. Okay? And it's organized based around what we call plasma membrane. Okay? And so this is that outside membrane that I showed you at the very beginning. Okay? That is a border or a boundary to keep the internal stuff inside and the external stuff outside unless um, you know it needs to come in. And if it needs to come in, there's ways at which it can come in, okay, through protein channels. Okay? And um, it's a way that the cell can regulate what enters and what what exits the cell. Okay? These are called plasma membranes are called semi-permeable membranes. Okay? And what I mean by semi-permeable, it means that certain things can cross and other things can't. Okay. So what the inside of the cell is, okay, is cytoplasm, or sometimes it's called cytosol. Okay. So you have this plasma membrane on the outside, and I'll show you some pictures of this. Okay. And then on the inside, you have this kind of liquid jelly-like structure okay, called the cytoplasm or the cytosol. Okay, which is going to consist of water, um, lipids, uh, proteins, some nucleic acids, okay, and um, some probably some carbohydrates, okay, and it and it's just a mixture of water and and some of these other more solid forms of things. Now, um, I often explain it to students. It's kind of like you know, you go to your grandma's house and and she pulls out a jar of homemade jam that's been sitting in the fridge for 15, 20 years and you know she takes it out and puts it on the bread and it's kinda like water's been added to the jam you know it's kinda runny and oozy that's what cytoplasm is like okay. and we can sh we can see cytoplasm and um, if you're in a live laboratory class you'll see cytoplasm you'll see the results of cytoplasm Otherwise, I'll post videos on cytoplasm so you can check it out. Pretty cool stuff um, and um, highly important for the functionality of the cell. Okay, and we'll come back to it. Plasma membranes, though, people often, when they look at them under a microscope or when you see a picture of a cell, you think that membrane, that outside surface of the cell, is solid. Okay? But it's not. It's actually fluid. It's a fluid mosaic. Okay? And so it has flexibility, a, a lot of flexibility in some situations, okay? and can move. And this is one of the key components to things like red blood cells in the human body. That ability to squish down and, and reform and things like that allows for it to move from arteries to veins to vessels to capillaries and then back. Okay? And it allows for it to move you know, around little blockages and plaque and things like that that form. Okay, so that fluid mosaic model is really important um, for the pure flexibility in these membranes. Now, some of the flexibility is lost because the membrane itself is a bunch of phospholipids, okay, but then it has embedded proteins. Okay, and we saw this in the original picture, and I'll show it to you again. Okay, those proteins. Um, have kind of two main functions, okay? And we'll get to these functions, but um, they're embedded between phospholipids, okay? And remember, the phospholipid it has a phosphate head which can encounter water or is hydrophilic and forms bonds with water, 
and then it has a hydrophobic tail. And so <clears throat> we would consider that phospholipid bilayer or the phospholipid molecule to have polar heads and nonpolar tails. Okay, so remember, if it's polar, it can form hydrogen bonds and it's hydrophilic. If it's nonpolar, it doesn't form hydrogen bonds and it's hydrophobic. Okay. So again, phosphate is water soluble. Nonpolar re region is water insoluble. Okay? So that should point to you certain things. First of all, what can enter the cell, okay? what can move across the membrane, is dictated mainly by these water insoluble fatty acids okay? because they're the middle of the membrane and nothing can pass through them that is polar. So here's kind of just a diagram of those um, bilayers, those phospholipid molecules. Okay, they can have a polar head region, okay, and a fast fatty acid tail. So um, this is a way to look at this is it's half fat, okay, and then half phosphate head. Okay, um, so you got polar head. Um, it's a polar molecule. You got a polar region. And a nonpolar region. Okay? And it's really important for that plasma membrane. The other thing that's important is something that most of you probably experienced before when you're cooking. So let's say you're making pasta and you add a little oil to the water okay? and you see that the oil droplets um, form little drops on top of the water. Okay? So it doesn't mix with water. And most of you know that oil doesn't mix with water because oil is a lipid. Okay? Well, the interesting thing about this is this is true for phospholipids. Okay? That phospholipids, when they're placed in water, will spontaneously form a bilayer. Okay? And this bilayer will have polar heads on the outside and fatty acid tails on the inside. So the, the internal layer, inter internal portion, is completely nonpolar. Now the reason why I bring this up is there's often speculation and often um, you know, criticism of scientists like when they say, well, how did life start on the planet? And most scientists you know, suggest, well, life started from non-living things. Okay? And People are like, well, how that? How is that possible? It's not possible. Okay? Well, properties like this allow for it to be um, much more likely, and the probability is much higher. Okay, when you can add a phospholipid, phospholipids are not alive, okay, to water, and have it form a cell. Okay? It's not too far off, and there's been scientists that have done this in laboratories, right? it's not too far off to trap things inside that makeshift cell. Things like RNA, okay? things like proteins. Okay? And then to have that be able to bring in new material, grow, use energy, things like that, we've already done it in laboratory situations. Okay? And so if you're interested in that, you can just, you know, Send me an email. I'll send you some papers about experiments I've done um, taking non-living material and making it as close to living as possible. Okay. So when we look at these bilayers, remember that they're not water-soluble molecules. And so non-water-soluble mo molecules can pass through. Okay, So anything that dissolves in water cannot pass through the cell um, unless it goes through a protein channel which we'll come to. Okay? Also embedded in these membranes is cholesterol and a lot of times people think well cholesterol this is a bad thing okay? unless you go to the doctor and they explain to you you know there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. Okay? Well cholesterol in itself is essential for plasma membranes. Okay? Cholesterol keeps the plasma membrane from falling apart. So it provides a little rigidity to the plasma membrane. 
enough so that when it squishes down, it bounces back. It returns to its shape. Okay? Now, here's the issue with cholesterol, though. If you increase too much of it, okay, then it's too rigid and it won't squish. Okay? And that's the problem that we have you know, in people's diets and things like that. Um, because what happens is if it doesn't squish down, then it can't get around blockages that are, occur in um, vessels and things like that, um, which can lead to cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, and different things. Um, um, from a human perspective, and also, you know, same thing can occur um, in all animals, okay, if they have too much cholesterol in their diet. Okay. We'll come back to that later. So the purpose of these membrane proteins, okay, is kind of twofold. You can have transmembrane proteins, proteins that go all the way across the membrane, okay, so from the external surface to the internal surface, and these are transport membranes proteins. So they allow for things to flow through. Okay? Sometimes it's active, which means that you have to supply energy to get that material back and forth. And sometimes it's passive and it just flows back and forth and keeps um, kind of a the inside, the cytoplasm, and the outside at equilibrium or close to it. Okay? And those proteins, you know, a good example of that is a protein called an aquaporon. Okay, and that's what allows water to flow through the system. Okay. There are other proteins out there. There are cell surface proteins. Okay? And these are proteins that don't go all the way through the membrane, but might just be on the surface on the outside. Or sometimes there is even cell surface proteins on the inside. And these are often associated with things like communication, um, things like attachments, uh, self-recognition, so you can have cell surface proteins that are pro producing or holding uh, carbohydrate, a sugar, okay, that shows that, um, you know, to your immune system, hey, this cell is self-made, okay, so don't destroy it, it's not a foreign cell, it was made in-house, um, and, and it's kind of got like a little rubber stamp on it, like, hey, don't destroy me, I've I was made here. Okay? Um, so that's where cell surface proteins come into play. Okay? And here you can see um, the different structures and different pieces. Okay? You can see these phospholipid bilayers, okay? one on top, one underneath, okay? cytoplasm, extracellular um, solution. Okay? You can see these proteins that go all the way through. Okay? And a lot of these will have channels. Okay? Sometimes they need energy to open the channel. <clears throat> Other times it's just a it's just a um, a polar region that allows for polar molecules to flow through. Okay, um, and then you can have uh, some proteins that will go all the way through, but they don't have a channel and they're just there as cell markers, so they identify that it's self-made. And then sometimes you have these proteins that didn't go through and they're just embedded in the membrane and they might hold off a sugar or something like that um, showing that hey this is a self-made cell or some kind of communication between cells um, can occur okay so that's just the gist the the general information around um, cells uh, whether it's prokaryote or eukaryote their membranes um, and they have cytoplasm um, same kind of setup, whether you have a nucleus or don't have a nucleus, okay, it's kind of the same general setup between the membranes. Okay. All right, so next time we're going to talk about prokaryotes, cells that don't have nuclei. It doesn't mean they don't have DNA, they do have DNA. Okay. And then cells that are eukaryotes and have a true nucleus and different organelles. Okay. And so next time, that's what we're talking about.